So welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Uh, the legendino Tim Vickery is with us in Rio. And uh, the uh, the night owl himself, Dot and Adebayo, the Duke of Earl, the Duke of Yak, is there. <laughs> The Talking about you know, the Duke, 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 Duke of Earl, 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 Duke, Duke, Duke of Earl. Talking of which, let's introduce our listeners to our guests this edition of the podcast. Are you, are you taking it south of the Mason Dixon line? No, I haven't got there yet. Oh, I'm coming to that. Oh, yes, I am. And I'm going north as well of the Mason Dixon line. Our guest is James Dixon, journalist and now new author of a cracking book. Uh, good afternoon, James. Afternoon, guys. Uh, wrong discipline for you, isn't it? A football. Um, you know, you usually go for the American version of football. Yeah, uh, for, for for a long time, much more into my into my NFL and my, and my college football. But uh, yeah, I'm sort of harking back to when I was uh, very avid into kind of you know British football or soccer, um, going back to the '90s, which is quite comfortable for me. Right. Um, there's one thing we should do before we begin, uh, James. Do Do you want to do the old fashioned way, or do you want to go the Stevie Wonder way? Up to you. I mean, which which one incurs more rights fees? Very good point. Very good point. <laughs> I'd go with the Stevie Wonder one, but we can afford that one. Apparently, the other one has still got copyright. But the one <laughs> that was a very good gambit. And the one that I would go for is the Swedish one. It goes something like this: Ya mo aleva, ya mo aleva, ya mo aleva, uti hundradio, ya viska aleva, ya viska aleva, ya viska aleva, uti hundradio. Your turn, James. Oh, oh I don't know the second verse. <laughs> <laughs> So, I can go. In, I can go in English if English is allowed. I can go in English. Go on then. It'd be Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Legendino. Happy birthday to you. I know the second verse of that. <laughs> you look like a monkey, and you come from the zoo. <laughs> uh, all of this, uh, all of this grotesque self-indulgence is in fact relevant because. Yes. What we are going, the game we are going back to today and the time we are, we're trying to recreate today. You know, it's exactly, I haven't just thought of this, it's exactly halfway through my time on this beautiful planet. Oh, God. so you are actually 986 years old. Yeah, give, give, give or take a day or two. Uh, no, I'm 56 and we're going back 28 years and 228 are 56. So ah. th this this marks the halfway point in, 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 in my miserable existence. It is the Champions League final between the mighty Milan of Italy and Marseille from France, who had ne a country that had never won a continental title. And all that was about to change in controversial circumstances that our guest is going to help us greatly to explain. Indeed, James, you've written a book about this match. So 26th of May, 1993, at the first Champions League final ever, as, as you know, in modern parlance of the European Cup, Marseille versus Milan. Your book, though, suggests that it's more profound than just a meeting of two, at the time, great European teams. Yeah, uh, it's it's... A very controversial final um, because a lot of people think that Marseille shouldn't have been it shouldn't have been allowed to be in the final or that UEFA should have taken some retrospective action. My book's called The Fix because this is a, a Marseille team that were found guilty of match fixing. They were found guilty of match fixing in a domestic context. Um, in, in part to help them prepare for this Champions League final to ensure that none of their players would be injured, that they would be well rested. Um, and yeah, so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very controversial start to the sort of champ, to, to, the, to the Champions League era. Um, it's, yeah, where do you want to go from there? It's, uh, you know. Well, where we can start from is perhaps given a background to the ownership of these two teams. I'll go to the ownership because hmm. arguably this final 
still has its repercussions today. And we'll come, come mm. on to that European Super League conversation in a moment or two. But this is the point where uh, owners or rich men who have little to do with football and perhaps, you know, don't really get the game and certainly are not as engaged in it as perhaps um, owners were previously, suddenly realise there's a lot of, of money to be made out of this. Yeah, I think, I mean, the two owners in question is uh, Silvio Berlusconi, the owner, the owner of Milan, and Bernard Tappi, the owner of Olympic Marseille. Um, I would say they were both, you know, passionate football fans. You know, they could have put their money into, into other things, but they, they weren't just motivated by trophies. They, they, were, they, they, were, looking, they were looking at football for, for, for profit as well. Um, and they particularly, the, why, why they were both interested is because they both had uh, TV empires and they, were, they, were, they viewed uh, football as programming and as a, as, a, as a way to make money. And one of the big drivers for the Champions League coming into existence was that um, particularly Berlusconi thought the old European Cup was an underdeveloped competition. The big teams didn't get to play against the big teams regularly enough. And when they did, there wasn't always the, the, the amount of uh, the stakes that, um, uh, that, that, that the games have now. I know you guys have, a couple of weeks ago looked at the, the, the Napoli-Real Madrid game, and that's a huge motivator for Berlusconi, that the fact that that game's happening in the first round, he, find, he, he calls it economic nonsense. He thinks it just it shouldn't happen there. So one of the one of the ideas that that is floated through uh, Saatchi and Saatchi and Berlusconi and Milan is for a European Super League, which obviously has, has come back in the last in, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and we get to this point of a compromise between sort of the big teams and UEFA, where they come up with what they call the Champions League, uh, which kept some bits of the old European Cup, a couple of knockout rounds. And then if you got into the final eight, you were guaranteed at least another six games, plus a share of the marketing rights, plus a share of the television rights. And that should give you, you know, the idea was to give the big the biggest teams, uh, a, a, you know, a, a decent share of a, a decent wedge, basically, from from European football. The, um, the the fix that so much has been concentrated on is a league game before this final, yeah. where uh, and it, it's 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 now a matter of legal record where is it Valenciennes were were, were were bribed, or some players there were bribed to, mm. to take it easy. Is this, in your opinion, is this just the tip of the iceberg? Was the, was fixing games part of the modus operandi of the Marseille of Ben Atapi? I have no legal training, so I'm going to be careful in terms of that. But it certainly, it certainly seems that way. Um, there were other games that were entered into the court records uh, where the, the court, the, the, the French magistrates and the prosecutors believed to be suspects. There were European games. There's a European game from 1989, AEK Athens against Marseille. There's question marks over uh, the 1991 European Cup semi-final between Spartak and uh, Spartak Moscow and Marseille. And I do apologise for my dog <laughs> in terms of um, doesn't normally do that. Um, but there's uh, uh, but the, um, the, uh, the the general manager of Marseille during this time uh, in his evidence against Tappy suggested that they that 45 different players had accepted bribes. So that was his evidence that was en entered in, in, into court. So what we can what we can prove and what we know with the Valenciennes game is there but there's so much else ar around this and, and he, his whole behavior is particularly dodgy if i can take you back to the group stage game against rangers which is a effectively the semi-final he tappy goes into the referee's room at half time and asks the dutch referee a guy called mario van der ender is there anything that he can do for him at half time of a group a champions league group stage game i thought that you know these Bill, you know, these millionaires would be operating on a sort of higher level rather than making it perfectly obvious in terms of what they what they were doing. Uh, and Mary, you know, he's very clear. He told him to get out and, you know, he, he was quite, quite strong on that. But that is brazen. You know, <laughs> it was in front of it was in front of Rangers club officials, in front of Rangers players, to the referee, in front of a UEFA delegate. What more do you need to think there's something wrong here? 
Listen, I don't have any legal training either, but I would have loved to have seen Marlon Brando play that role, just that part of the role. I'd have loved to have seen him because I think with all the method acting of Marlon Brando, he would have got that one to resonate forever and ever and ever. We wouldn't know anything else about the movie, but we would know this bit. Is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> Either his brains or the result is going to be on that on that on that final score sheet. Ouch! Oh. Ouch! Yeah. <laughs> Should we talk about the match? Because there is a match to talk. We can return yes. to the conversation about the wider subject. See, I, I, I'm glad that you've you've steered us there because football. At the end of the day, it is always football, uh, and there are always footballing things to to talk about, whatever the, the context. And the context fascinates me as well for reasons that I want to explore both of your French knowledge. But just the football, I think it's a, it, it's a decisive moment because, as we've said, the French had never won a continental title. And that the, the French sides of the French national team, you know, in the 78, 82, 86 World Cup, they were lovely to watch. But they were kind of brittle and they were quite, they were, they were quite lightweight. And... Uh, that was true about French football as well. I mean, there was there was an Italian cafe in Soho I used to, used to live in until the, the the owner lost it in a in a casino on the other side of Archer Street. Uh, and I remember watching the previous year, the Cup Winners' Cup final, which was Werder Bremen and Monaco. Monaco trying to be the first French side to, to win. And they were a lovely side. They were a lovely side to watch, but they were lightweight. And you knew the Germans were going to win, and they did. And the year before had been Marseille in the final, the, the, the Chrissy Waddle side. A lovely side to watch. They're in a final against, against Red Star, and they couldn't quite do it, and they lost on penalties. And it's Marseille back in the final. It's the same coach, uh, the Belgian, the veteran Belgian, Raymond Cotals, but it's, it's a totally different team. And one thing you can really identify is it, it's, it's a less joyous team than a less happy-go-lucky team than the previous French sides, but they're big and strong. Well, they're skillful as well, but it's, it's Desai team, Boli team, you know. And I look at this match and you see the blueprint for the French subsequent success, you know, becoming world champions for the first time five years later, European champions in 2000, uh, world champions again, the reigning world champions. And it's not, the football that has made France successful hasn't been the joyous Platini, Tigana, Gires that enchanted us in the 80s. It's been much more functional and much, much more physically strong. And I think you can see this in this Marseille side. So whatever, whatever was going on, it's an important moment purely in football terms. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the time where um, the, the first time we get Barthez, Desai and Deschamps together as, as, as a spine that gives gives that solidity. Uh, and obviously they go on in 98 and 2000 to, to reach the highest they do. It's in part, though, driven by pragmatism. Tappy at this time is, is much more focused on his, his political career. By 92, he's entered the French cabinet. He's the minister, is the minister for cities. Um, he's kind of taken his, he's he fallen a little bit out of love with, 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 with the club. Not, you know, probably maybe a bit strong, but he's, you know, the experience of 91 losing on penalties. Also the experience of 90 where they lose against ben, in the semi-final against Benfica to a really controversial goal, a sort of hand of God type goal. Um, the, and, and then they, they go out in early in 92 as well. And so Tappy's focus has changed. He's starting, he's feeling a bit of financial pressure as well. Papin is sold to Milan for, ten, for, 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 for about 10 million pounds. Um, so they're getting younger, but they're really getting cheaper. They're trying, they're, they're trying to get offload some of the big wages that they were spending before and, and, and cost control. And it's probably luck is, is, is not fair, but it, it's, it's, it's certainly fortunate that they stumble across Barthez, who comes in from Toulouse, and Deschamps and Desailly come in from Nantes, and they find this wonderful spine of a team that can take them to take them where the, the beautiful team that they had in terms of Waddle and Papin and Abedi Pele couldn't quite get them. Yeah, I, I think the 
uh, the direction that this conversation is going in, both from Tim's angle of uh, how the French flair, if you like, of their non-championship uh, winning days stood out, but also where you're going, James, with this, <clears throat> with the political influence, I think that speaks volumes, you know. I mean, it's funny, I'm, I'm not here to criticise Tappy or Berlusconi, but interesting that both of them followed a similar route. Uh, Berlusconi, of course, famously became the Italian Prime Minister on several occasions <clears throat> and uh, also added the phrase bunga bunga into the vernacular. Mm -hmm. But um, the it does seem to me as if football or football supporters start losing control. Uh, it, it, not necessarily because of this match, but certainly this is the era in the UK as well. We know that uh, politicians have now um prior to this gotten control of football because of hooliganism and so on and things change for football well, it's all it's all television isn't it well I mean, it is it is primarily I mean, our generation grew up without football on li live football on tv it just didn't happen you know that's mm. why the fa cup final and the world cup was so important uh and you know the, the likes of berlusconi and tappy have seen as as uh, as james was saying it's it's content for for the cable TV explosion and so on, and it it changes it changes everything. It changes the finance. It changes the target market, which is no longer the fans in the stadium. It's the millions you can reach all all around the world. So it's a huge game changer. But the thing that is is just amazing to me. You you, you put Berlusconi and, and Tappy in the, in the same boat, but Berlusconi is is far right and makes no bones about it the, th the, the thing that has always shocked me about France and I know Dotton you know France very very well is that Antapi's a socialist somehow you know I mean, France I've always thought of France as a country where people have a very strongly defined ideological position and then French socialism you know Mitterrand Mitterrand Good in his youth well in his youth was a member of a, a kind of far right group called the Jean Droite went around beating up communists. And then he's a Vichy minister, uh, or, or I think he was, he was involved in that. And, it, you know, he stages a, 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 an assassination attempt against himself. Uh, and, and somehow he, he manages to reinvent himself and become, a, and become the, the leader of the Socialist Party. Uh, and there's space in it for fly-by nights like Tappy, who's, is it fair to call Tappy an asset stripper? Is that, is that how he's, he's, he's made his, his, his money? James. He's a financial guy and he comes in and he takes over companies that are underperforming and, and he, he turns them around. Is he an asset stripper? But he's certainly not, not, not a, a conventional socialist. What on earth happened? No, I mean, he's, he, he gets his first big break with a, a chain of health shops called La Vie Claire um, and sort of turning them around. I think, he, I think he would probably phrase it in that he looks at sort of distressed assets and can can go in but you, you know what management consultancy type you know that you know it's it you know it's go in it's lay it's lay people off it's reduce the cost base and and and, and, and incre increase the prices um it's we can you know we can we all probably have views on that but it's um if you look at him from a footballing context and for a brief time as well he was head of adidas he owned that he owned he owned adidas for a time and that that legal battle is still rumbling on about because he had to divest it when he got into politics and how that was sold from underneath him has been a, a 20 plus year legal battle in France when he got into you know in, into sport first into cycling and then he was asked to take to to invest in Marseille by the town's mayor but because they wanted a bit more pre prestige they saw him as a guy who had done well in in business who had done well in cycling and they said can you come in and can you turn can you turn Olympic Marseille around can can you get us to where we want to be um and so but from his stewardship of the football club match fixing and all that kind of you know he put money in and there's no doubt about that but he did it because he saw he thought he'd get the rewards on the back end you know the um and first of all let me say berlusconi might not describe himself as a far right politician um i think he would describe himself as a right-wing conservative politician um but you're right there there is a uh, 
uh, kind of conservative history. family values and orgies. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah you know, we're yeah. not we're not here to judge Tim. No. Not, I mean, exactly. maybe we are. But the, but the, the thing with Berlusconi as well is that he kept really good relationships with with left with left wing politicians as well on his way up. He wasn't. He he he. He may have shifted right uh, in, in in his later years, but actually on the on the way up, he was identified as sort of a left center cent, you know, center left person. And the and, and the coalition that uh, that Forza Italia kind of put together, it was sort of talking differently to different parts of Italy when when when, when they were talk that they were saying very different things in the north to what they were saying in the yeah. south when they first got elected. That this is very That's true. Amazing. And also, you do have to go to the war to understand the differences of left and right in both Italy and France. In France, champagne socialism is really what they created. You, you could be a socialist like Mitterrand. And, you know, Mitterrand's son has got all sorts of issues, uh, you know, talking about all sorts of political issues around him. He's not the kind of uh, champagne socialist who would say no to a pay rise. Let's just put it that way. And um, in Italy, as we know, you know, I'm not, I'm not in any way comparing Berlusconi to, um, you know, the fascism of uh, people like Mussolini. But we know there that was always a kind of like uh, you know, left is um, working class and right is you know toffs or whatever it's not it's not as clear cut as that what i would go back to just briefly is what you said about television so th this is the advent of uh the idea that football is a slave to television to a certain extent and television is where the money is and the wider audience out there it's funny what i was trying to say before about how politicians took control of football i remember look I don't know where football hooliganism started in the United Kingdom, but I do know the moment it started being, football started being shown on terrestrial TV all over the place, us kids, and I'm talking about 12, 13 year old kids, as young as eight, actually, I remember going to matches as young as eight, we wanted to get on the telly. And the one way to get on the telly was to invade the pitch. And to say, if you look at those early pitch invasions, all the kids are doing is going like this, you know, up and down in front of the TV camera. They're not really fighting each other. They're not kind of destroying stuff or anything like that. Well, even a lot of the violence, the the the, the English violence, there was an aspect of like foppish theatre to all of it, mm -hmm. wasn't it? I mean, there, there was some serious stuff going on, but a, a lot of it was a kind of almost like a theatrical. It was it's it was it was a very strange phenomenon, wasn't it? We're a strange island race. But look at this match. Do you not think that there is a certain foppishness about it as well? This is football before VAR because some of those tackles, for yeah. goodness sake. But I, I, I remember I, I, I was at the game the, the year before, uh, Bas Sampdoria uh, in Wembley, the final, and I remember the night before watching the Italian ultras roam around and I thought fuck me these people are serious you know they they, 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 they look like paramilitary you know they, they, there was none of like the foppishness of it that you get from the English you know you you thought right if you get in a rut with these people this is this is serious they have made a very serious option to be kind of far-right football thugs they look like they own the stadiums as well OK, uh, it, it, back to the match for a moment. And we're, we're going to switch from the match to your glorious book as well, uh, James. In terms of quality, I thought this match was something of a cracker. OK, there is some real, real sort of uh, violence going on on the pitch, as I've alluded to, and some unnecessary behaviour. But you see what I would argue are probably some of the finest footballers in Europe at this time battling it out. I mean, the names on both sides are just amazing. You know, you've got the Dutch contingent to a certain extent um, for, uh, you know, playing on the side of uh, AC Milan. And then you've got, yeah, like you said, the French spine 
for Marseille, but there are others for Marseille. I mean, Rudy Voller pops up in there and you're thinking, no, I, I don't remember him playing for Marseille, but there you are. You've got the finest footballers in, in, in Europe playing against each other. So in a way, Berlusconi's theory is right. Let's put these people together. You will get a great game. What did you guys think of the game? For, for me, it's uh, it's such a change of pace from the previous European Cup finals, which were were, were relatively disappointing, uh, particularly you know the, the the 91 final where Red Star came out just to not play. Um, the game starts at 100 miles an hour. It is absolutely frenetic. The first minutes you've got two or three chances at each, at each end, and you can look at the final score and say, oh, it's a one nil, but it. it it's not. It's not a one nil. It's it's two. It's 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 two. It's two sides. You know, go, go, going at it. Um, you, you've got you know, Voller. You know, uh, playing. I think playing on the pitch with Frank Rijkaard for the first time since uh, the Italian ninety World Cup, which is an interesting sort of um, you know bit of subtext and a, and a sub battle there. Alan Boxic, uh, the great sort of Croatian striker, was was was, do, was doing a lot there for Marseille. Um, and then on the on the Italian side, you've got the Dutch, you've got the Dutch contingent, but you've also got uh, January Luigi Lentini, who has just been the previous year, just become the highest paid, uh, you know, the world's most expensive footballer. And then you've got this sort of no name kid from Nantes called Jean Jacques Edele, who is marking him out of the game, the world's most ex you know, expensive. There's so many individual battles all around, and for me, it, the the intensity even lifts when Papin comes on because Marseille do not want it. the Marseille players who were there before do not want to let their old leader who'd been there he'd been at the club for six years and he gave a really emotional speech on on, on you know on the on the pitch when he decided to leave to go to Milan they were not going to let him come in come on after half time and take away their first uh, European Cup and, and the it is such an intense battle. Uh, there's a there's a there's a left wing back called Eric Demeco who's now a commentator in France. Uh, him and Papin were really really good friends. And when Papin comes on, he's wound up because he thinks he should start. He's kind of like Gaza um, in the '91 FA Cup final, but coming up, coming off the bench, he's putting in really high tackles. He's challenging. He's a high foot on the goalkeeper, and Dimeco just goes for him, like you know, um, gets right in his face and gets super angry at him. And they, 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 that's a friendship with essentially over for a number of years. They were really good friends, and they just let it all out on the pitch. And I, I was a, a Barcelona nut. I was there, as I say, watching Barcelona winning. And, uh, and that was my kind of football. I, I, I always saw Milan of that era as the opposite pole. Mm. It was, they were more like, uh, they were a more skillful version of George Graham's Arsenal. Uh, when, uh, Bad Badezi is a genius. Badezi is the best defender I've, I've ever seen, I think. But the way they just used to squeeze the space. Uh, and it meant that there was no space and it was all fire. It was all it reduced space. And it, when, when Milan started on this under, under Saki, it had been really revolutionary. Hmm. Uh, and other teams had, had learned how to deal with it. And I, it led to games that were just were condensed into so little space. Hmm. That was, uh, there, were, there was a lot of sound and fury, but there wasn't the, the, there wasn't the, the ball flowing as it did with Barcelona. Uh, so I, I remember watching the game and thinking, this isn't really my, 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 my type of football. Yeah, I, I think I think I think I think that's fair. It's 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 almost a very sort of you know, like say English or Ang Anglophile way of way of way of playing. One of the things that happens in 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 this game is um, Gertels is a little bit uh, disappointed with how much space Milan are getting in the first sort of fifteen minutes and makes a, ta a tap change um, and push and and they push the defensive line higher and higher throughout the game um, essentially just relying on the off on, on an offside trap um, which Milan probably breached a couple of times but you know without the you know this is where you know you say v, you know the, the good the good side of VAR there was a couple of times that Milan were through maybe two or three yards onside and they're flagged, and they and they and they well, don't. It, it kind of makes you realise how good the linesmen are these days. Because even without VAR, I think you'd, you'd have had a different decision. Mm. With, with today, I think the, the linesmen today and the referees' assistants are so much better than they were. 
almost certainly you know they're professional for one <laughs> you know they they, they this, they, this is their job rather than they're, they're co coming at the weekends from being dentists or lawyers or wh whatever they were it's a huge difference because there was one go or one move that Rijkaard would probably have been one-on-one -on -one with the keeper and scored and he was miles as say in exaggeration on side and he got ruled offside I don't, I, he didn't I, don't rem I don't remember anything being made of the reunion of Rijkaard and Foller you know, three years earlier, they're spitting at each other and so on. I don't remember anything being made of that in the, in, in the game. These days, it would have been a big story, surely. I think they'd already put it to bed personally. I, th I mean, Rudy Voller, uh, as I've, I've learned through this process, is one of the nicest men in football um, and a, a real gentleman. And uh, he, did an, uh, he did an advert with Rijkaard um, that, that sort of made light of this. So it was, I think it was, I think it was a German advert. It could be a Dutch advert. I'm sorry, not quite off the top of my head. But they'd personally already put that. And as far as I can tell, never he held any ill will towards Rijkaard, which is certainly not how I would react in that situation. I think not, so, not so much for the spit. The fact that he got me sent off in a in a World Cup mm, would be maybe sure. the the bigger thing. I think your analysis of the match, though, James, is more like mine. Um, what I remember of it first time around was it was one of those matches, as you said, with all these individual battles going on. There was so much going on off the ball as well as on the ball that you like, what you got, you know, where shall I look next? You know, somebody else is going, some little person, somebody's going to have a tug at somebody else. It's going to be like words somewhere else. Somebody else is going to have a kick at that. I mean, there's one point where Marco Van Basten really was, probably still is my favourite um centre forward, although he's playing something of a number 10 role, I found here. He's, he's a provider as much as anything else in this game because he'd be marked so tightly. And there's one point where he literally gets a kick right on the chins. And it's not one of those that he falls on the ground, but it's one of those that we used to do at school. You know, when somebody kicks you, you're like, oh, oh, and you start hopping up on your foot. So he doesn't fall on the ground. He literally feels it so much. He's like holding his ankle, standing up and limping and limping. And I thought, it's the end of it. Yeah. It is the end of him. It's the end of him. Yeah. That, that, that's the tragedy of it. I was coming just to that. This is the end of Marco Van Basten. He gets kicked out of the game and gets kicked into retirement um, a couple of years later. But this, this is the last match he plays, isn't it? Essentially, it's, it's 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 very much the last. It's the last match he plays. Van Basten had a really interesting book last year. Um, doesn't think that he got kicked out of the game. Actually, he mm. thinks he appreciates the physical side of. The, the, the physical side of the game he really puts the blame on an ankle surgery that was botched so um in in december of 92 he has uh, ankle surgery um and it just goes wrong uh, and he struggles to come back uh, and milan bring him back early because they're struggling this is the milan team that had gone 56 games in all competitions without defeat Finally, they've they've gone seven without winning and the, the, the urge to kind of get him back in the team, he's on one leg. He, he, he plays away against Ancona, which is how desperate they were. So they, they needed him against Ancona because they were worried they were going to lose the league and it was, and was going to slip away. And they're obviously trying to get him fit for this game as well. But it's one of the few times that Capello makes a sentimental decision. He's obviously not fit, but Capello loves Van Basten. And he wants him to play. And this is the stadium as well, where it's the high point of his career in 1988 as well. This is the stadium where he scores the volley against the Soviet Union to win Holland their first world, the first international title. Brilliant volley. It's one of the best goals of all time. But five years later, this is the, this, 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 this is the stadium where he walks off and he never plays again. Um, he tries to come back and two uh, for a couple of years and, and he finally admits defeat and Milan give him a sort of send off in a pre-season game against Juventus. Um, Van Basten's waving to the crowd and the crowd are saluting him. But Capello is sat in the dugout sobbing, just sobbing because his career is over. And, he, and, 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 you know, it's not what you come to expect from Capello, basically. Uh, but that's the beauty of Van Basten as a footballer. He could, you know, inspire those emotions. And, you know, it, you know the, the silver lining, as he says, is that people never saw him get old. Um, and he, and, and he, appreciate, he appreciates that people remember him at his peak and not, you know, go, you so know sliding a, down the leagues. He's a James Dean who didn't have to die to, uh, to stay young forever.
Yeah. Thank you for that cue, um, because I'm a rebel without a pause, as you know. Um, and also, James, what gets me is when I say that I remember this game first time around, you also remember it, even though you were half my age, uh, more or less, at that time. And uh, actually, you were you're probably you were about a third. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just about to correct myself. Don't worry. Don't worry. You were a third. Of, well, well, brother, it was twice my age and I could sing to you. I'm in love with a man nearly twice my age. Mm. But not you, not you. But um, yeah, as an eight-year-old, because this is what inspired your book on The Fix, you remember this game uh, seeing it first time around as an eight-year-old, what, what what did you make of it then? And have you had to go back and revisit it? Yeah, so for me, this started when I was eight years old and the, the uh, football had been taken off television. And so, you know, the Premier, the Premier League goes onto Sky. I'm a eight-year-old who wants to consume as much football as I can, but all I have is are European games. And the first game, European games, I remember watching a, a Leeds against Stuttgart. Uh, and the second, and that's from this year, the the Champions League this in in this season, um, and that's a, a great tie. It actually, takes three legs to resolve because of some shenanigans with foreign players, etc. Then Leeds go on to play Rangers in the two battles of Britain, which you know the whole playground has stopped to, and, and you know is, is talking about. And for me, I just followed Rangers on through that, you know, because as the sort of thing that you did, you know, you support the English or the British team that was in Europe, particularly as an eight-year-old, I was a, you know, what was I going to do? Watch Birmingham City in the Anglo-Italian Cup. It's not, it's not the same. Even I knew that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as speaking as a Birmingham, so, so, but, you know, when I was got invested and I'd watched, you know, the Leeds games, the Rangers games, it just made sense to watch, the, and, you know, there was no point in stopping at the final. But how, how did that lead to, you mentioned the process of writing this book. I'd really like to find out what that process was. How did that lead to writing a book about the background to this match, the sort of unedifying background to it? I think it's, for me, I wanted to read something about it because I obviously knew the game and then knew that there was something that had gone wrong, but it, because it took so long to work its way through the courts and because there wasn't the internet at that time and maybe the coverage of, of European football wasn't, wasn't as good as it, you know, as, as it was, I'm not sure that we got a good resolution and, and I didn't necessarily know how it, how, it, how it had ended. So I was looking to read something on it and there wasn't something. And then we get the pandemic, I get, yeah, and I was like, well, if you're not gonna write a book during, you know, a pandemic, this is the time so I had I had time for research uh, and I kind of put myself into it and initially I thought it would be the story of the season on the pitch but you can't tell the story of this season on the pitch without everything that's going off the, off the pitch not just the match fixing but the the economic and political drivers that are forcing U, uh, UEFA to change you know it is the television money but it's also the collapse of communism you know the, the old UEFA tournaments it just so happened that there were about there were about 32 national associations and that is makes a straight knockout tournament very very simple when you start getting 45 national associations trying to cram them into a 32 team bracket becomes quite harder uh, you know, much harder so you know it's, it's you know okay we need to change how do we change and who is going to be driving that process of change and and from my perspective and unfortunately it's been the, the bigger teams and the big leagues at the detriment of the sort of small and medium-sized leagues you see this is why james is such a perfect guest for this brazilian shirt name podcast isn't it, Tim? Because he doesn't just talk about the match, but he talks about the wider social context, which is what we do, uh, essentially, straight up our street. And we'll come on to some of that wider social context in just a moment. But do you mind, James? I know it, for a journalist, this might be sort of uh, like going back to kindergarten, but for many of our listeners, the dream is to write a book and not just to write any book, but often enough to to write a book about football or about a generation in football, or a team in football, or, you know, to do a um, fever pitch, Nick Hornby, or whatever it might be, one's own memories in football. Well, where do you begin? How, how do you begin? And what research and how do you go about it? It seems like you spoke 
to Rudy Vola. I, I imagine you spoke to others who were um, instrumental around this match, this particular match, but also in the wider context. What do you do? Draw up a list of things, and also there's always a conundrum: is you know, do I just assemble all the research and then start writing, or do I write bits and pieces and so forth? Do you mind just telling us about the process as it's your first time? Yeah, so like, and, and that is an important caveat. This is how I've done it. This is not the way to do it. So um, for me, I wanted to, uh, you know, I came up with a sort of central idea um, be before be before going and writing. And I, I, I researched that and I tested that hypothesis, uh, doing, getting a lot of, um, you know, reading as much sort of contemporary stuff as, as, as I could that's, that's available from the internet. I'm fortunate that 93 is just about the time where uh, some papers have, have got their archives online so you can see stuff. So the, the Independent is, is great because their archive goes back to about 1992. So that worked really nicely for me. So it's nice and easy to access. Um, but then I, f I found the process of getting a publisher not not daunting, which I guess many people might do, but really helped um, firm up the idea of the book and the going through that, having to pitch it and say like this is this is what the book will be about. This is what the this is this is the structure that it will follow. This is who it will appeal to. These are the books that it will be similar to, and going through that process of acquiring a publisher made the finished product a lot better. Um, and so once. And because there is a debate in terms of should you write it and then get a publisher or should you try and get a publisher first? I went to the publisher first. It helped me improve my process. And then I was able to go to um, essentially players, managers, people who are still alive in, and involved in, 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 in the football of the, of the time and say, I'm writing a book. It's going to be published. You know, this publisher, I'm working with this publisher. Can I talk to you about your memories? And I found the best way to not go in and, and to, I found a lot of people quite receptive. Some people aren't, that's fine. I, I, rem, I remember uh, an email or a response I got back from Hans van Broekelen, the, uh, the, the PSV goalie. And he said, it was, it was uh, James, uh, good luck with your book. I am not interested. And it was, it was just like, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Don't laugh to him. That's happened to us all. <laughs> Well, he's, he's, I remember Van Broeklen when uh, goalkeepers couldn't pick pick up the back pass anymore. You know, yeah. and he was just outrage. <laughs> I, I have to learn how to play football. I cannot <laughs> play football. I have to learn now. I'm not interested. So <laughs> it's the same hands, Van Broeklen. Yeah, and and from a from a writing perspective, that's much better than someone stringing you along. And, and you know, so it's I'm not interested. Okay, we'll move on. We'll find someone else to talk to to talk to to get that PSV perspective. Um, and yeah, I think just be open, be really honest about what you're doing, and, and set aside time. If you don't set aside time, if it's gonna, if it's something that you're gonna you know something that you say you're gonna do or you're always gonna get to, you never get to it. Give yourself a deadline, and you know. And also don't be afraid to don't be afraid to rewrite, but also don't rewrite for the sake of it. Sometimes go back to something you've written a couple of months earlier and think it's absolute garbage. And it might be. Um, but sometimes you just you, you probably wait a day or two before deleting it because you could just be in a bad mood that day. <laughs> Mate of mine teaches creative writing and he told me once about the three rules of writing. Number one, start writing. Number two, finish writing number three publish what you have written and that's all there is to it <laughs> yeah i yeah, know that that makes sense it's logical it's a tautology all of that but the you, you mentioned that uh, you you wanted to see the sort of social context and cultural context as well um you, you know what we do on the brazilian shirt name we we do try and find a way to talk about the soundtrack of the time, which we'll come on to in a second, have a look at the pop charts at the time, whilst uh, uh, some of the great footballers of Europe are kicking uh, seven bells out of each other on, on the pitch. Where was the match played, by the way? Where was it played, do you remember? It was in Munich. It was, it was in Munich, so yeah, neutral ground as always of uh, Champions League final. Uh, whilst they're kicking seven bells out of each other, there was a musical soundtrack, but there was a social context as well. And I'm looking on the front page of The Guardian here. Um, this bodes for, 
I suppose what we're still sort of dealing with in terms of the migrant crisis of uh, people coming over from uh, not least Africa, but elsewhere in the world as well, uh, to fortress Europe and being turned back. Front page of uh, The Guardian on the 26th of, sorry, yeah, 26th of May 1993, the day of this match, which is a Wednesday, by the way, um, says that uh, the EU or the EC, as it was still called then, the European Community, um, uh, cracking down on illegal immigrants uh, throughout the European Community has been agreed by, uh, this crackdown has been agreed by Interior Ministry officials of the 12 member states, there were only 12 member states at the time, and is expected to get political uh, approval at a meeting of ministers in Copenhagen. Uh, next week, in case anybody thought that this migrant crisis was a very uh, modern issue, uh, we can go back, what, 27, 28 years here and see that the EU, in a way, haven't dealt with it uh, over all this time, over a generation. They're still sort of cracked down, cracked down, cracked down without a real sort of a, a solution as to how to deal with it. But also on the front page is one story that caught my eye. Did you know that the Hells Angels are, and I quote, a world crime menace. Apparently, uh, at this point, according to the uh, Guardian's crime correspondent, Duncan Campbell, the Hells Angels are the world's fastest growing criminal organization involved in drug tra trafficking, extortion, and credit card and mortgage fraud. And this is according to international police intelligence. And forcing people to li listen to Guns and Roses records. Was it Hell's Angels that forced people? I thought it was, you know, DJs and that sort of thing that forced so us. It's all part of the same worldwide conspiracy, I think you'll find. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll find the Guns N' Roses' first album was a blinder. Would you not say? James? Is that Appetite for Destruction? Why not? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, 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 I've got, I've got nothing, nothing, nothing against it, personally. <laughs> Thank goodness for that, because you, you can hear the other bloke in the background there in Brazil. He, May the Lord have mercy on your souls. <laughs> yeah, well, um, great news, though. The charts at the time, I know you were only eight years old, but you probably bought these records. The charts at the time, first three What's records, number one. <laughs> yeah, James, you're taking the blame for this one. Number one, two and three in the charts on the 26th. May 1993 are all Reggie songs. Have you noticed that? I, I'm not the one who introduced reggae to Scandinavia. Ah, oh, very good point. Very good point. Okay. <laughs> I will, I'll take UB40 as a brummy. I can have that, but you can have Ace of Bass. <laughs> Well, Ace of Base, let me just say, I'd left Sweden by this time. <laughs> I'd been gone for over a decade. But I will take responsibility for it. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I didn't introduce reggae there, but I certainly did a lot to crank it up and certainly introduced what we call the Toast Mester Scarpet, which was the original reggae rap competition in Sweden. Um, you know, because reggae rap is called toasting, or was in those days, or emceeing, or whatever. They don't quite do that. So Ace of Base are two young sisters. And what they've done, uh, I thought was amazing, actually, because a decade before, when I'm in Sweden, uh, Swedish bands are still struggling, apart from ABBA, struggling to break out of uh, the constraints of being from a country, that, playing pop music in a country that isn't England or the United States, or isn't Britain or the United States. Here come these two young sisters, and they're predicated by the person who's gone before them is somebody that I know. And he didn't do a reggae thing. He did a kind of quirky kind of dance pop number, which was Dr. Alban. Dr. Alban, or Jar Alban, as he used to call himself when I knew him in Stockholm. Uh, he became Dr. Alban when he did um, a degree at the dentistry, um, the, the College of Dentistry in Sweden. So he is a qualified dentist. Album. But, you know, w w when I was there, he was just studying for his dentistry, but he was actually a DJ. He was a DJ. Do you remember Dr. Album? It's my life. I do, yeah. Yes. I, I, I had no idea that came out of Sweden. No that idea. That came out of Sweden. Well, he's a Nigerian guy, but he got to Sweden 
I don't think he got there as a refugee because there's no refugee problem from Nigeria at that time. I think he got there to go and study, but he spent his early time there in Sweden being a DJ, a brilliant DJ, actually. There was a little club, a little tiny club. This was in the days of, you know, migrants have their own clubs and, or immigrants have their own clubs and, you know, Swedish people have their own clubs and usually they didn't meet. Um, and um, he he was a DJ at a club called Shaft, a little tiny DJ, but it was the wickedest club in Stockholm, I must say, a club called Shaft. It was at the end of, for those who know Stockholm, at the end of Birger Jarlsgatan, uh, the sort of Vasa Stan end of Birger Jarlsgatan, because Birger Jarlsgatan... Ah, oh, the Vasa long... Starter end, yes. <laughs> Vasa Stan. Oh, Do you know yes. what Vasa Stan means? Vasa Stan no. is that, an old part of town. <laughs> Let me look at my note. <laughs> Do I know what Vasa Stan means? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I lived in Vasa Stan actually. So, a Stan means town, and uh, Vasa is the old kingdom of Sweden, you know, in the days of uh, not the Vikings, but after the Vikings, you know, the, like, the Vasa. Um, anyway, so he had started off, he had, and I literally blew my mind. I was in uh, California, living in Los Angeles, 1990. Um, running around with Lisa Stansfield for a minute. And uh, Jai Alban was over in America promoting this song. And I, hadn't, I, hadn't even, I was like, Jai Alban, Dr. Alban? What Dr. Alban that I knew in Stockholm? He's, he's here in LA promoting this, this record. That was last I had a contact with him, but he did the absolutely phenomenal. And I think was this before Roxette? Roxette might have come out about that time, but generally it was like one, every now and then somebody came out of Sweden. It was very, very rare. So I, I, I love these two girls. And but it, it's, it's the moment perhaps when European youth or continental European youth are filtering through Jamaican music and black American. Because as, as well, we've got the, I've got an obsession with them because I think they're so dreadful, but dreadful in a, you know, in a wonderful way that you can't take your eye off them. The two unlimited with tribal dance, you know, which is the, dreadful. The, the, yeah, it is. You know, it is. But they're, they're so strangely fascinating. The, the, the two unlimited, you know, uh, which is you know, feel what's going on in Detroit and so on, and they've come up with their own, their own techno, techno, techno version. Uh, so th there's there's quite a lot of Euro schlock and and so much very very soft reggae in there really really kind of watered down reggae and I, I carried a banner for you before too I think they were great for years but by this time they become a they just become a karaoke band haven't they I, I personally would agree with that I, I don't know about you James but I know you're a youngster so I'm giving you a little bit of the history but as a Brummy I, I, I sat in with the Brummy fans once with the Birmingham fans Alex McLeish got me tickets so I'm in with the Birmingham fans uh, and uh, they're around going duh, 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 duh. And I'm thinking I know that what's yes, that yes, it, 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 it's food for thought yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, I thought it was great you know but so honestly obviously no one's going to be, uh, no Birmingham fans are surely going to be singing uh, Can't Help Falling In Love With You, the UB40 version. Take yeah. my hand. But they lost the fire. See, I think they've been unjustly criticised, UB40. Uh, and I saw the, the fellow from Steel Pulse have, have, a, have a pop at them. I think it, it was just jealousy, I thought, because... Mm -hmm. uh, and he was saying, he's a very articulate guy. David, is it David? David Hines. David, David Hines. Hines. That's right. Very yeah. articulate guy. Um, but he was he was saying, you know, yeah, Steel Pulse weren't as big as UB40. The audience buys itself. Hmm. I'm not and sure. I don't think, well, that's what he said, but it's oh, just that's not true. Said. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I, I was it's not say. true. Otherwise, you know, they'd never bought Bob Marley, for example, well, yeah. or all of the black music, which has done so well in England over the years. But the difference is, UB40 had songs, you know, and, and, uh, and, um, I'd say the difference is right for a while, weren't they? UB40, and then the fire went out. Uh, James, honestly, I'm, I'm passing over to you yeah. now, but let me just say one quick thing off the back of what Tim said there about David Hines, because he was on Five Live talking about, you know, UB40 and the two tone, particularly the two tone. And he said, look, it killed our business like 
playing who had been playing reggae for a lot of while because suddenly all of our audience or a lot of our audience and the focus the of radio and tv was on two-tone and for us it wasn't two-tone it was just ska and we've been playing ska all our lives but you know somehow in what he says it's really important to think about it we'd been playing ska all our lives says the black sort of roots reggae guy who took themselves very seriously and along comes this other generation. They think, ah, oh, well, let's, let's have some fun with it. Let's remarket it, repackage it. And you sell it, not as something to get heavy about. And this is with your light reggae as well. So it's not get up, stand up for your rights. It's let's just go and have a party. Bob Marley's biggest songs are the ones where he's not singing get up, stand up for yeah. your rights. They're the ones where he's singing, um, don't worry about a thing and everybody sings it at a party. I was so dis I did TV with Clarence Seedorf and he talked about his love for Bob Marley and I was so disappointed when he when he said my favorite by far is One Love. Oh. I was thinking you know this <laughs> brilliant you know. track. But we, but, it's a brilliant track mate. Come but on. But you can't and I I love waiting in vain. I think it's I think it's my It's a brilliant track as well. Bob Marley would have said to you and I knew Bob Marley remember Bob Marley would have said to you look I love every one of my music and if me want to sing uh, one love me, I got to sing one love. That's what he would have said. But well, that's Except not an accusation. The Jamaican. <laughs> he wouldn't but have said it with a Nigerian accent. It's not an accusation you can level at UB40. You know, the, the first hit is is, is, uh, is about the way that the first world mistreats the third world, you know. Yeah. They, were, uh, they were they were really, really heavy. And, 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 and it's they, a multiracial band. And, and actually, they carried that political activism through a little bit UB40. My memories of UB40 were um, sort of around the industrial decline of Birmingham, and particularly when the, the Rover factory was facing closure, which seemed to always be facing closure, um, you know, dur during the, the 80s and 90s before it eventually uh, went by the way. But you would go to those marches to save the jobs of, you know, everyone at Rover and in the supply chain. And, you know, UB40, you know, were there giving of their time and, you know, and, you know, and, and, and helping coordinate and, and support that activism. And, and, you know, you know, they were a big band at the time. They didn't have to, but they were, they, you know, they're still, they're still involved in the sort of local community in Birmingham there. I think your point about the kind of, um, you know how the how the, the youth of Europe is sort of awakening is potentially interesting. You've got to, you've got to put this in sort of sort of context. We've we've we're three years out of the end of the Cold War. That's a heavy sort of sort of political time. People are being promised that the future is going to be brighter. It's going to be it's going to it's going to have less conflict. And you know maybe you know and they're probably wrong. But in terms of but there's it's it, there's there's a there's a wave of optimism that's coming that's that's coming that's coming through there in the early nineties. And you, as you are you part of the generation who felt that? Because that means that means nothing to me. I didn't feel any of that at all. You're an old man. I mean, I think I'm, I think, you know, I remember the Berlin Wall coming down, but I didn't under, I didn't, un, I didn't understand the context of it. I didn't realise David Hasselhoff did it and all that kind of, <laughs> kind of stuff. So, but I, I can't, but you, you certainly, you know, it was, it was one of those, it was one of those things where you, you, you pick picked it up almost via osmosis people people were scared there was a there was a threat you know there was a worry about about, about nuclear and, and all these things and we've got we have different challenges then and then and now but I do think people were sort of hoping perhaps naively that we were moving past you know politics was it uh, was it Francis Fukuyama sort of yeah, the yeah. end the, the end, end of history. history yeah I mean you know but then there was at least a strand of opinion at that time that thought maybe we're getting to sort of a settled, settled sort of Western liberal democracy, every, you know, you know, and, you know, who knows? I don't know enough. I was eight years old. I was, I know. I was watching cartoons. This is, this is why it's very, it's, it's very fortunate that uh, you have with you on this podcast people who are 50 slightly ever so slightly older than that and um the see what, what i mainly remember is the fucking rent going up <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thinking, yeah this this isn't a golden age <laughs> no, no, no. Parts to that. <laughs> what i remember is not being able to go to flipping berlin where i'd sort of uh hitchhiked to berlin in my younger 
you know, gotten into a lot of difficulties trying to hitchhike there and everything. But suddenly it's all falling down and they've done it without inviting me to the party. And I just sat at home watching it on TV and trying desperately to try and um, get the money together to go to Berlin. Just didn't manage it at that time. But um, interesting, I'm tying this back to your book, James, because exactly what you said there, and well done for bringing it up because this was the big story of the time, was um, the fall and the unraveling of the Soviet empire, as it were. Uh, Yugoslavia is also about to unravel with uh, devastating consequences uh, to the Balkans. But it has an impact on football, doesn't it? Because this is the, uh, the part of the context of going back to Berlusconi not wanting the riffraff to join in um, in the Champions League party. Suddenly, Yugoslavia, for example, a powerhouse of football, are now at least three, if not four powerhouses of football, arguably the most powerful of them being Croatia nowadays. But, you know, we, we always knew Red Star, Belgrade and those kind of teams are always part of the uh, European Cup uh, um, context. And suddenly there are all these other teams, apart from the Soviet Union, you know, Russia and all its satellite states or the Soviet Union satellite states, I mean, Ukraine, who would have thought that Ukraine would be a powerhouse in football? But it's become something of a, um, a strong mm. nation in football, it's certainly provided a lot of great footballers, etc. I wonder whether it is the wider historical context of the time that informs the way that this great game that we all love, it builds a roadmap forward, going forward. If at this time it was the breakup of the Soviet Union was part of the thinking of, look, we've got to do something about this. Yeah, we get the television, we get the money that's been made, we get these two important, um, if not uh, uh, perhaps um, you know, somewhat um, um, uh, uh, you know, challenging characters in, in, in football ownership of AC Milan and Marseille. I, I get all of that, but then there's a wider thing going on, which is all these other nations are now part of the UEFA family, and mm -hmm. they also want to be part of the pie, and they're not going to be as strong as AC Milan or Olympic Marseille or any other team for quite a while. So what do we do now? Which informs which? I think I think first you 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 get and the biggest biggest impact of the of of the of the breakup of, of the sort of Eastern Bloc on, on this season is the, the the suspension of Red Star. They're the Yugoslavia are banned from the competition two years before they, they'd won it. And when the country's falling apart in, in 91, 92, they still get to essentially the semi-finals. They're a they're a great team, and, and they would have been, they would have still been able to make a challenge. But the real big driver is is isn't sort of at the technocratic level at UEFA. It's economics again. The clubs in the clubs in the Eastern Bloc now need money. The the, the 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 economies are opening up, and they need foreign currency. And what have they got? They've got players, and before they were allowed to sell players unless unless the, unless the Communist Party and, and and the government agreed, and they would normally allow players to go at the end of their career when they were twenty eight plus, you know, when they weren't when they weren't as good. So you get an exodus and a sort of flood of East, really high quality um, Eastern European players coming into Western leagues, and because you've still got UEFA's free for rule, they're not all going to the top. They're not all getting, you know, being sort of hoarded at one or two teams. You've got that in, to, in, to, in Stauburg, 89, Stauburg Bucharest get to the European Cup final. Haji goes to Real Madrid. That, that entire team goes to Western Europe within a couple of years. And they're not at fashionable places. They go to Brighton, they go to Foggia, they go to Osasuna. And all the... So, what the clubs in the East, which would have been strong if they were able to keep their player base, if they had, if they could compete on an economic level, are giving up their, their, their resources to enrich Western clubs. And that's essentially creates the, the imbalance. If you go back to the early 80s, 80, the, the 1982 season, which Villa definitely win the European Cup <laughs> in uh, a, tra a tragedy, as we can all agree. Of course. There are four Eastern teams in the quarterfinals and four Western teams in the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. 
it, it, you know, that's that's at the moment that Europe has parity in, 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 in the European Cup. It's not often the West tended to do better, but mm. it's the, the player drain is, 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 is the first thing. And then you get Bosman. And then, and then Bos and, and, and Bosman's not just about about player movement at the end of contracts. It's about recognizing this thing, which was the EC in 1993, as that Guardian article told, front page told us, has become the European Union. And, and you know, if you're a Swede in the European Union, or if you're or if you're Irish, or if you're Spanish in the European Union, you have to be treated the same wherever you are. And then that's when the, that's when the clubs are able are, are able to start to stockpile all the talent, and then the and it's sort of the, the you know them reinforce themselves, uh, and that's when football becomes less competitive. It's a great metaphor, I think, on the whole age of history, the end of history nonsense. Mm. What it really means, and all of that kind of golden ageism. What it really means is a system now in place, both economically and in football where there's a massive hierarchy and the rich are going to stay rich and the poor are going to, are going to stay poor. And it, and it's the, the kind of social mobility of my and Dotton's youth. Also the football mobility, allowing clubs like Villa to, to, to win the, the, uh, the, the championship of Europe that goes no, the, the, the end of history means that the rich have reached a state which is very, very comfortable for them when their, their hierarchical position isn't, isn't going to be challenged. When you look back after everything that you've done, how do you view this Marseille team? With love, with disdain, with a mixture of emotions, what do you think? They're, they're complicated. You know, part of me really likes Bernard Tati. <laughs> Like in terms, just he's a rogue, but he's he's really good value in terms. Of, did I think Chris Waddle said that he used to go around the dressing room before squeezing players' bollocks? You know, it was yeah. <laughs> allegedly. We need, we, allegedly. Yeah, we, we, we need we need bollocks. You know, we need we need bollocks and more bollocks. <laughs> you can't yeah. do that nowadays, mate. So let's just stick the allegedly. <laughs> for goodness sake. Um, but yeah, from 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 a, from a football point of view, I think you've got to you've got to discount some of what they, they did. As much as you could admire the players, and there's you know there's lots of players on that side that are, that I, I, I hold in really high regard. You you've got to factor in the the, the dishonesty that was in, that was involved that was involved in that. Uh, and you know maybe they're guilty of maybe they're just guilty of the eleventh commandment. Maybe it's just that they got caught. You know, and maybe other people were doing it as well. But you've got to, we've got to take what we know and sort of factor that in. So, personally, uh, you know, they're a hard, they're they're a hard hard team to love. But I think you've got to respect them. Uh, that, and that's that's where I fall on it. Did the dishonesty affect the outcome of this match, the the Champions no. League final? Not no. at all. And they never tried to bribe uh, or, or they never tried to influence the big games because there's no point. There's no point going I to wasn't Berezi thinking, and Maldini because... No, I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking in terms of affecting the big games in terms of bribery or anything like that, but in terms of players having been rested, for example, the mm. more sort of subtle parts of this. I don't think so. So what, ha what happened was, uh, you know, both federations tried to help out their clubs. Uh, the Italian Federation moved Milan's game to a Friday night instead of Sunday, so they got five days rest. France went one more and moved it to a Thursday, so they could get six days rest. I don't. Ultimately, Valencians were in 18th place in the league. This is it, it's it's a bit of a tragedy because you just didn't need. You probably didn't need to do it. In, well, if, certainly, <laughs> certainly from today's standpoint, you wouldn't need to do it because oh, of the yeah. stockpiling. You have these. A squad. Yeah, you'd have, these you'd have a squad. Uh, and uh, the o the only the only player who plays in the final for Marseille who doesn't play in the in the in the fixed game on the twentieth of, of May is Bolly because of his injury. Um, but yeah, all, the other ten play. Like, you, you're right that you'd have a squad now. Um, they're so complicated, and I think everyone's got to make make their own judgment. It, it's it's part it's it's partly moral, but I'm I'm not naive. I don't want anyone to be naive and think that other teams weren't doing this. I'll give, if I can give one really quick example, Milan, who are the, who are the victims of this, if, 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 if you see it that way. Four days later, they're playing Brescia 
to uh, uh, and, and with the Serie A title on the line. They only need a point, and Brewer in a relegation battle against Fiorentina, who were a more historic rival of of, of, of Milan's. Would you anyone like to guess what the, what the result was? <laughs> it was it, it was a draw, and not only that, it was a draw <laughs> where Milan definitely let Brescia score against them. Peter Brackley on commentary for Channel Four and Football Italia, he, he, you know, calls it out as it's happening live. There's a is, is, he, that- is he with Ray Wilkins? Because I remember watching it. Because you know, Wilkins played for, mm-hmm. uh, and Wilkins, yeah. These are the kind of things that happen in the Italian football, you know. He's kind of... yeah, yeah, I think. It, I mean, if you if 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 you watch, I think it's jo- Joe Jordan. I could be wrong, but I think it is Joe Jordan. And Joe Jordan also played for Milan. He, he was like he, on commentary. He said, "Our viewers are getting an insight into what happens in Italy." Right. And it was a, it was very convenient. You've got a center, like a big lolloping centre half for Brescia who absolutely skins Franco Baresi and goes past him. Now, I'm not day. saying he couldn't yeah. do it, <laughs> but it was very suspicious. <laughs> so let's. Let, the point is not to be naive about uh, about, about this era. Uh, and like I said, it is possible that Marseille are just guilty of getting caught. It's been such a fascinating conversation. Brilliant. Alas, we must bring it to an end. Um, let me just say, it's a great book, James. Uh, I haven't finished reading it. I will finish it at some point. It's called The Fix, and it tells you all you need to know about the way that European football has changed. And the point of change being this match, this Champions League uh, match between uh, Ace and Olympic Marseille on the 26th of May, 1993. Uh, well done you, James. Uh, as, as a first book... Yeah, I, I'll tell you, you did really well. And uh, it's an unputdownable read because it's an investigative book, amongst other things, as well. And thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, can't have done it without you. Uh, let me just apologise to Prince William and all the other Aston Villa fans. We didn't know. We didn't know he was going to say all of that. Yeah. <laughs> He's on his own on that one. <laughs> no, I'm thanks sorry, so David Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for that <laughs> that was even worse actually <laughs> yeah thank you james no worries thank you very much brilliant yeah. that's great cheers jim, jim thank you very much yeah absolutely wonderful james 